Well, um, thank you, Melinda, and welcome, um, er, welcome everyone, and th thank you for welcoming me. You guys are all Northern Arizona Association of Realtors, so I guess I'm the only non-realtor here. Um, Probably. <laughs> so appreciate it. Um, uh, again, my name is Jess McNeely. I'm um, the Assistant Director of Community Development for Coconino County. And in that role, I'm the planning manager. So I'm over the planning and zoning division. Um, I manage um, everything that goes to the Coconino County Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, many of those items then go on to the elected board of supervisors. Um, I work with, um, so with entitlements on any project that requires a rezoning, a conditional use permit, a uh, new platted subdivision. Um, and um, we work to update the county's comprehensive plan, the long range plan for the county. We, um, we work with the city to update the Flagstaff regional plan, which, uh, which encompasses a lot of land outside the city limits and, and a lot of county land, particularly where a lot of development takes place, uh, where there's a lot of population in the unincorporated county outside of city limits. Um, and we, uh, we also update what's known as the county area plans. There's 10 county area plans. Uh, many of you who are realtors working in the surrounding areas around Flagstaff are familiar with Belmont, Kachina Village, um, gosh, the uh, Fort Valley, Baderville area. All, all of those areas fall within the Flagstaff Regional Plan area, and each one of those has their own area plan. So we work to update those, those policy land use plans. Um, that's some of what I do. Um, in this presentation, uh, or it's really not a presentation, it's a, it's a discussion. Um, I'm, uh, I'll be uh, running through some things that Melinda prompted me to talk about. And if anyone has questions at any point in time, let me know. And, and I'd really like to approach this as a discussion. Sounds like we have a lot of time and I really didn't prep that much material. So um, the discussions are, are, and questions are welcome during the, uh, during the discussion, not really a formal presentation. And certainly I've reserved a lot of time at the end to just take kind of any random questions uh, that I can help with. Um, on this first slide, you have my, uh, my email there and my direct line phone number. Um, I do recognize some names on here, so I've, I've worked with, uh, with many of you before, you've called before, and, uh, and really that's what we do here at the county, and, and particularly in my role, we serve the community, we serve you guys, you have questions, there's ways we can help you, um, that's why we're here. So with that, I will go to the next slide. All right, this is the list, Melinda, this should look familiar to you. Uh, that, that you prompted me with, so you, you made this easy for me. I didn't have to. I didn't have to think through um, awesome. what to discuss with you. Uh, so I'll probably jump back and forth between between this list of uh, proposed topics and uh, and a map that I've got here that can help with some of our discussion. So the first one: um, what development projects are currently in place but not completed? Those coming and those under review and or uh, projected to affect Flagstaff. Well, you know, really um, uh, everything that takes place in Coconino County affects Flagstaff. Likewise, what takes place in Flagstaff affects uh, what takes place in the unincorporated county. Um, supply and demand uh, drives particularly housing, but also commercial development as well. Um, and when there's uh, demand, um, then we see, we see development um, and, and we're seeing plenty of it. As a matter of fact, the first thing I'd like to start with, um, just to prompt a lot of the discussion, is just letting you guys know where we are um, as a county, as our department, um, with permitting. Um, so those of you who aren't familiar with our department, the Coconino County Community Development Department would be the planning and permitting agency for all development that takes place on private land that would be land owned by individual property owners, not the national forest, not um, one of the tribal uh, nations or tribal entities such as Navajo Nation, Hopi tribe, um, not state land. Um, so all of what's left over in the way of private land, which by the way, is only about 12% of the entire Coconino County landmass, 
uh, that land mass being 18,000 square miles, second largest county in the lower 48. Um, so only about 12% of that land uh, actually is, is in private hands that, that is developed under us. Um, we have the permitting authority on it. Um, and, uh, and of even that 12%, some large chunks of that fall under a few big ranches. So then it starts getting narrowing down even smaller than 12% of, of what actually we tend to work with to get developed. So it gets pretty isolated which spots in the county that we get used to working with. And for those of you who don't know, is, is the planning and permitting um, department for Coconino County. Um, that includes uh, planning and zoning. So the zoning ordinance regulates what land uses, what can be permitted on what land, uh, depending on what it's zoned. That includes building permitting, which is our most active and, and biggest division within our department. So that's the, the permits to, to, do, to build new homes, to, uh, to do renovations, to make any changes to, uh, to homes or buildings that requires permits. Um, that also includes environmental quality, which is essentially wastewater. So the uh, vast majority of the unincorporated county does not have um, uh, community wastewater systems. So that means on-site wastewater. Most of you would refer to on-site wastewater systems as septic systems or advanced treatment um, on-site wastewater systems. Um, and the other division that is included in permitting is um, our engineering division. So our engineering division issues encroachment permits when you're gonna make a driveway cut onto a, uh, onto a county road. Um, they also issue all grading and drainage permits. Grading is if you're gonna, if you're gonna move more than 50 cubic yards of dirt on property. So if you're moving dirt around, um, that's going to require a grading permit. So we are really a one-stop shop. Um, for if, if you own a piece of property out in the unincorporated county and you want to build a home on it, um, we are the uh, uh, we are a one-stop shop to do all the permitting for that home, uh, generally speaking. And that's, that's you know, 90 plus percent of, of what we do. Um, the other division that um, uh, that is not a permitting division is our sustainable building program. So I always like to make a plug for that. Um, they are a free, um, just value added program within our department that the county offers at the county expense uh, to help um, property owners, developers, uh, whoever make their project more sustainable. Um, so they have resources they can help you with um, energy solutions, most typically um, solar panels. Uh, they can help you with rainwater catchment systems on how to do um, sustainable um, uh, water supply for property. As most of you know, uh, most, most of the county does not have water systems at all. Many people develop in our county on a haul water uh, system where they just place a tank on their property and have a delivery truck or they themselves uh, with their own uh, tank um, keep their, their water cistern filled for their, for their drinking water. Um, let's see, sustainable building. It also helps just with the overall energy efficiency of buildings. So anytime um, someone is wanting to build in our county, they can make use of that free program and have access to a lot of resources. A lot of resources, a lot of research that's already been done, a lot of ways to help your project meet code, meet building code, and have sustainable and often uh, very much uh, money-saving features. So. Um, our top statistics right now, um, you can look over the past couple of years. In 2019, we did 281 new homes, what we would consider a single family dwelling um, in unincorporated Coconino County. Now that includes site built homes, um, you know, what we commonly refer to as stick construction or anything that's actually site built. It includes manufactured homes, it also includes modular homes. Uh, many of you know the difference between a manufactured home that meets HUD standards and modular homes um, under, uh, under state regulation. It also includes ADUs, accessory dwelling units. Um, accessory dwelling units have become incredibly popular uh, in, uh, actually across the entire US, certainly um, in this part of Arizona and in our county. Um, so, most of these accessory dwelling units that we're seeing are an additional guest house, granny flat, mother-in-law quarters, whatever you want to call it. The, the name under the zoning ordinance is ADU, accessory dwelling unit. 
And these are going on to properties that are already developed with a primary home and the accessory dwelling unit is being added. Uh, the county historically regulated accessory dwelling units. It wasn't too many years actually before I got to the county in 2016 that um, if you were going to build an accessory dwelling unit, a second dwelling on your property, you would have to deed restrict it, that you wouldn't rent it. Um, that requirement was probably being ignored even after it was deed restricted many years back. At a certain point in time, um, the zoning ordinance was updated to just free up accessory dwelling units. Um, uh, so yeah, um, all single family residential zoning districts in the county uh, entitle, uh, authorize an accessory dwelling unit. That accessory dwelling unit is limited in size and uh, it's limited in, in how much of a separation, how far it can be from the primary dwelling, but it is not restricted as to renting it or who you rent it to. Um, many of you all know that in Arizona, per state statute by state law, local governments, cities and counties cannot regulate or prohibit vacation rentals, um, Airbnb, VRBO, uh, that really drives a lot of development um, in our area. And, uh, and probably the lack of regulation um, on uh, vacation rentals has definitely driven a lot of these accessory dwelling units. Um, so uh, it kind of classifies what all types of homes, you know, when we, when we talk about homes, uh, what types they can be and some of what's driving, driving their development. So in 2019, 281. In 2020, that jumped to 362. We saw a tiny blip at the beginning of COVID. And then after that blip, then nothing but increase in, uh, in development. Um, we primarily attribute that to low interest rates and just increased desire um, to live in more remote areas. Uh, many people, uh, including uh, our staff, were able to work remote through most of COVID. So we really see that as what drove increased development in our area. Jump to this year, 2021, through the end of June, through the end of last month, we are already up to, so just halfway through the year, we're already up to 224 um, new homes uh, through the end of June. Um, so we are definitely on pace when you look at that trend from 19 to 20 to 21 uh, to outpace um, previous years. Um, uh, one thing I would point out, um, as uh, the unincorporated county, we're actually permitting more homes throughout the entire unincorporated county. Now, that's a huge area, uh, covers many sub areas, and we'll get to the map and look at those sub areas. Um, but we are permitting more homes right now than the city of Flagstaff and what gets built inside the city limits. So that's just a little, um, a little nugget of information. Um, so when we move beyond homes, residential, particularly single family homes, um, in uh, 2020, we did 33 commercial permits. Probably the majority of those commercial permits um, are expansions of existing commercial. Um, so not necessarily new commercial. Um, so far this year through June, so only halfway through the year, uh, we're up to 30 already. So you see that, that commercial development is even outpacing um, numbers-wise, uh, statistics-wise, percentage-wise, uh, residential. Um, when we see new commercial demand, uh, the biggest demand we're seeing is campgrounds, RV parks, RV storage, um, and certain demand for hotels in areas where there's enough um, utilities to actually support hotels. Uh, campgrounds, there's a reason why campgrounds have, have taken off. I mean, not only did they get popular uh, during COVID, but prior to COVID um, in, uh, let's see, I believe it was um, towards the end of 2018. Let's see, the, the county zoning ordinance was updated. We did a, a significant update to the uh, county zoning ordinance. This is great. I'm in my office right now, so I can actually look at the uh, look at the document um, let's see it, it was the it was the end of 2019 uh, in um, towards the end of 2019 
we had an update to the um, county zoning ordinance that included many things, um, but one of the biggest changes was freeing up the ability to do a campground, a commercial campground, and we have some specific definitions of what that is. Um, in the G zone, uh, those of you who work in the unincorporated county know that the G general zone is a 10 acre minimum parcel size zone, so large lots, um, and the typical use of the G zone is residential, single family residential, and ag ranching um, is the most common uh, ag form. Um, so the zoning ordinance update towards the end of 2019 made it possible for property owners to get a conditional use permit, CUP, that has to be approved in a public hearing with the Planning and Zoning Commission for a commercial campground in the G zone. Um, there's a few reasons why this happened. Number one, they were happening, they were happening illegal, illegally anyways, um, and there's huge demand and uh, forest service campgrounds, uh, national park campgrounds, like the campgrounds in the, uh, in the Grand Canyon National Park really can't accommodate the demand. And there's so much demand um, uh, that uh, there needed to be a way to accommodate it. So um, commercial campgrounds are flourishing. We're doing lots of these. Um, uh, it's the term uh, glamping has been coined. So that's, that's become, a, become a common term for these commercial campgrounds. Probably the biggest ones that you might be familiar with would be one called Under Canvas um, that is uh, right off the 64, right off Highway 64 in the area commonly referred to as Valley. Um, and uh, in addition to Under Canvas, that was our first big one. Uh, we now have one called Clear Sky um, that, um, that people are becoming familiar with as well. So that is a, um, a significant commercial development type that is new to the county. Um, RV parks have always been around. Um, RVs, as many of you would know, uh, have become only more popular during COVID. And um, uh, there's, it's, it's actually hard to buy an RV right now and uh, um, RV parks are doing very well. So we see demand for RV parks. And of course, RV storage. People who buy these RVs need a place to store them. We certainly see a pattern where um, people who live in the Valley, somewhere in the Phoenix Metro, buy an RV. They get tired of driving it up and down the mountain. They find RV storage somewhere in the Flagstaff or greater Coconino County area to leave their RV um, up here. Uh, save themselves on gas and, and the pain of driving that thing up the mountain. And uh, then they just drive up in a passenger car, grab it for the weekend and take it out to wherever they want to go. Um, hotels, a little bit of hotel activity, um, uh, obviously just demand for, for tourism um, and accommodating lodging. Uh, but hotels obviously require more infrastructure uh, than a campground. You know, these campgrounds in the G zone, many of them are going on, they're going on haul water. Um, they're going on on-site wastewater systems. Uh, they're primarily tents, yurts, um, temporary structures. So very low infrastructure hotels, obviously you got to have better road access. You've got to have um, typically uh, water and wastewater systems to, uh, to be able to accommodate them. Um, and, and we can discuss where we're seeing some of the hotels. The other interest we're seeing um, certainly in residential development, uh, all of you guys know that there's just demand for um, residential. Um, we are seeing an interest in residential at higher densities. So that would be duplexes, um, actual multifamily developments. You know, we, we don't see high rise apartment buildings in the county, obviously, but things that would be some kind of other attached housing, uh, triplexes, townhouses, uh, some different um, interesting multifamily developments. Um, some of these can include manufactured home parks. So uh, manufactured home parks are continuing to, um, to draw demand. And um, what many people are trying to call tiny home communities, often they really amount to, they function the same as a manufactured home park, just the units they're putting on them, um, you know, meet what people or, or uh, appear as what people uh, consider a tiny home. Um, all the considerations for all of these residential developments at higher densities are that they need water, and there's a real lack of that 
in, uh, in unincorporated Coconino County and in the region um, at large. Um, and if any of these developments require like a zone change going through the public hearing process with the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Board of Supervisors, uh, they develop a lot of opposition. Uh, what we call NIMBY, not in my backyard. Everybody um, agrees that uh, we need affordable housing, we need workforce housing, um, uh, tends to gravitate closer to, um, to Flagstaff. Uh, however, um, all of these projects uh, generate a lot of opposition. Um, and we've seen some denials uh, because of that opposition, probably um, at, the, uh, at the Board of Supervisors and at the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, before I jump on to the map to discuss where a lot of this, uh, all of this activity is taking place, does anybody have any questions? And I don't know, Melinda, if you're gonna be able to facilitate questions or, or how that would work. Uh, we have a QA and a box at the bottom. So with any questions, feel free to put those in there and I'll uh, be able to uh, present those to you as we continue to go. So, uh, okay. or if uh, now is a good time, any of those more. I, I had a question as far as tiny home developments, where, where yeah. especially? Where particularly do you see those happening? We've had, um, well, it's interest, right? So we see some really small ones, had a couple of really small ones go into Oak Creek Canyon on some land. Um, and uh, you, would, you would look at it and call it a tiny home development when it really comes down to it. It was residential land in Oak Creek Canyon, um, two lots next to each other where under the single family dwelling, primary dwelling and accessory dwelling unit, they essentially put two tiny homes on one lot and on, on the lot right next to it, put two more tiny homes. So when you look at it from the street, you're like, hey, this is a tiny home development of, of four tiny homes. Well, it's uh, a primary dwelling and accessory dwelling um, on, on two abutting lots is really what it came down to. So um, people love them for vacation rentals. I guess they are Instagrammable, if that's the word. Um, and, uh, we are seeing some interest for those in, um, the, generally the parks area, what, what would be referred to as the parks area. So we actually have a, um, a proposed development, uh, on the planning and zoning commission hearing agenda, uh, next week, next Wednesday, when the planning and planning and zoning commission holds their hearing, um, there's a tiny home development, uh, which really it, it, it functions as a manufactured home park. And they're getting the zoning for time for manufactured home park. They're just presenting it certainly with their graphics and their images as a tiny home community. Thank you for that. Can you uh, distinguish the difference between the two? What, what actually classifies a tiny home versus the manufactured home? I, I assume it's still processed the same as it's a manufactured home. It's just a smaller size. Exactly. So tiny home, I mean, it's, you know, we, we joke and say, you know, it's, well, if it's cute and you'd put it on HGTV, now it's a tiny home, not something else, but um, so um, we did update uh, the county building code to accommodate smaller homes. Um, so any homes that are built at like 600 square feet or smaller, um, there's some special accommodations made for um, simple things like ingress, egress, and um, uh, insulation, so energy efficiency, um, to be able to accommodate these smaller homes. Um, so in that way, our building code gives some special considerations for a home of 600 square feet or smaller. Um, and um, if, if a tiny home is built to manufactured home standards, then it can go anywhere a manufactured home can go. If, it, uh, if it's a site-built tiny home, then it can go anywhere another site-built uh, home can go. So really, we don't, you know, we don't classify them under any of our regulations, uh, the zoning ordinance or the building code, as a tiny home. Um, like you would a manufactured home or a modular home versus a site-built home. We just let it be uh, whichever one of those things it, it aligns with by code. Gotcha. And does that affect what type of septic system one is allowed to put in? It, very good question. It's the septic systems are the tails that wag the dog in, um, in residential development in the unincorporated county. Um, the, the fact that they are smaller um, uh, have fewer bedrooms and fewer fixtures, yes, generally results in a smaller, smaller, more affordable um, wastewater system. So that, that's just a generalization. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if you're going to have a backhoe show up to your property um, and, and uh, start doing the digging to put in an on-site wastewater system, you're looking at a pretty good chunk of money. You know, it, it can be a smaller system, 
if the house and the number of fixtures are smaller. Gotcha. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, we do have a few questions here, so I'll go ahead and rattle off a few for you here. Yeah. Uh, Nadia asked, may I get a recording? And you bet. I believe this is recorded. And um, Ventrice, maybe you can give specifics on how that's sent out. It's on, uh, uh, we can send it to you guys, I suppose. Um, and then her next question, is it possible to have a small manufactured home installed on a bigger lot right next to a single family home? That's a very good question. And that's actually something we clarified with the 2019 update to the zoning ordinance. So um, as I stated earlier, all residential zoning in the county allows for one primary dwelling and one accessory dwelling unit. So essentially two homes. Um, depending on your zoning, if the zoning allows for manufactured homes, then either one of those homes, it doesn't matter which one's which, can be um, site built or modular or manufactured. Um, just for your information, modular uh, can go anywhere a site built home can go under the county zoning ordinance. And modular is typically double wide. It's built to the state standard and it, it typically goes on a, like a stem wall permanent foundation. Manufactured is built is more of what people consider a mobile home, uh, but the, the correct term is manufactured home. Manufactured homes are done to HUD standard, can be a single wide, and can go on essentially jack stands and uh, stands and tie downs. Doesn't have to go on a permanent like stem wall foundation. Um, so if your zoning is G uh, general or AR agricultural residential, uh, which are the typical um, large lot zoning districts in the county. Um, you could do a site built primary home and a manufactured home accessory dwelling unit right next to it, right? And then there's all kinds of ways to skin the cat on how you do the utilities, the water, the sewer, the power. They can share, they don't have to share. Um, there's, there's, that just becomes a permitting process on, on how you're going to accomplish that, usually with what's most cost effective for the property owner. Great. Does that answer the question? I think so, Nadi. If not, feel free to unmute yourself and, and reiterate. But I thought that was a great explanation and a great question as well, Nadia. Great explanation. Thank you so much. It was great. Yes. Absolutely. Great. And then Kevin Stewart's question is, AZ close to passing an extra tax for short-term rentals or extra tax on owners of more than five investment properties? Mm. So... We're the community development department. And I like to start this, this discussion about what we do. We do permitting. <laughs> you have to talk to the assessors because they're the ones who would care about that and know about that. So yeah, that's, that's not on my um, radar. Uh, and, and I monitor obviously um, Arizona chapter of the American Planning Association. So I usually know what kind of legislation is taking place that would, um, that would affect planners and planning. Um, in, in the state. That is not something that, um, that I'm seeing rise to my level of awareness now. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if the county assessor's office uh, maybe is tracking that more closely. They would definitely be the ones with the vested interest in, um, in how all that is taxed. So sorry, I can't help you more. That's okay, give us some good, good direction if nothing else there, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin, for your question. And Stephen brought us his question. My apologies that this was already answered and I'm 15 minutes late. Is there a county website or tool where I can find accurate information on the zoning of a parcel? The parcel viewer doesn't always have this information. Agreed, sometimes we have issues on the website. So are we just missing the accuracy somewhere where to obtain that information? That's a very good question. He's jumping ahead to when we go to our topics on, on how we can help you uh, how we can help you fish instead of just handing you a fish every time you um, uh, every time you need something. So the parcel viewer, um, if it's if it's private land that is zoned, you should be able to click on any piece of property, and a dialog box comes up that you can scroll down. And if it's a if it is a unincorporated county parcel, it will list the zoning. Um, uh, again, typically G A R. If you're in like Kachina Village, it's going to be RS, um, and, and there's there are areas that um, uh, where you have some commercial zoning. Um, so you should be able to click on a property in Parcel Viewer, 
and parcel viewer will, will tell you what the zoning is. If you're having problems with it, you can always call our staff. That's why we're here. Uh, but we do like to, to help um, enable everyone to use the parcel viewer for all the information that's there. Um, if you're clicking on a property and it's inside the city of Williams or the city of Flagstaff, you're going to scroll down to that zoning. It's going to be blank and it's going to say um, not county jurisdiction, you know, see that city. Um, city of Flagstaff has a very good uh, zoning map that you can go to, much more complex than ours, um, and, and find out what a property is zoned. So yeah, parcel viewer is still the go-to. Um, our basic uh, website, um, the community planning department at the Coconino, at the uh, main Coconino County website, um, we have links within the planning and zoning division to parcel viewer. And then we have links to the zoning ordinance, uh, which is not the easiest thing in the world to read, but I would encourage uh, anyone who's a realtor to become more and more familiar with it all the time. It has the setbacks, it has the listed uses, has other performance standards. Um, everything I've been talking about with accessory dwelling units, um, it's all in there. I, I fully understand uh, it's not the easiest thing to read, but the more you familiarize yourself with it, um, the more you'll be able to use it and, uh, um, and be able to find what you're looking for. And we're, we're always here to help, so you can always call. Uh, that call may not be answered as quickly as you like. We've got uh, myself and I got five uh, planning and zoning staff who work here with me and um, we stay busy. I probably spend 25% of my, of my time just answering questions from property owners on what's my zoning, what can I do, I wanna do with this, is that possible? What process would I go through to do, you know, what it is they're wanting to do? We spend a lot of time talking to people. And, and so just to reiterate, access to find information, um, uh, defining those different zonings would be where? Um, the coconino.gov, and I apologize, but maybe after this is over, we can put in the, um, uh, in the, um, chat the the base the base county website but there's there's one pri yeah the coconino.gov is is the one basic county website um there's link in there there's a way to navigate to any of the departments um, if you just go to the community development department uh, it's pretty easy to navigate within our department website where the planning and zoning information is versus the building division information versus um, environmental quality engineering and sustainable building and our favorite code enforcement that's that's the best part of our job okay. um, which like uh, which which i won't bore the realtors with uh with code enforcement uh, we, we like to be proactive and help people help people develop their dream um, if necessary then we have to do some code enforcement is there a particular code that you're having to enforce more often than others you know uh zoning ordinance is always the biggest one um, people unhappy with their neighbors and having too many junk cars in their backyard or having more horses um, than the zoning ordinance allows um, or outright running running businesses that would not be permitted under the zoning ordinance or that might require a conditional use permit. Um, we get lots of those and we get complaints. I mean, a lot of what drove our updates to the zoning ordinance with uh, with the commercial campgrounds in the G zone under a conditional use permit uh, were, was complaints that people were, were doing unpermitted, unauthorized campgrounds out on their land. Um, so we figured out a way of like, hey, there's so much demand. The, the local resources can't accommodate these. We, we got to find a way. There's so many people doing this illegally. Let's figure out the safe, right way to have compatible land uses with, with surrounding other property owners to do this through a, through a legal process. So that's, that's why we updated our ordinance to do that. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, there was an issue with hoarding as far as, you know, people keeping too much junk in their yards and neighbors complaining about it. It was becoming a, a greater issue than it ever has been. Has the county been able to, um, have y'all been able to kind of uh, deal with that a little bit better? I know it was quite overwhelming for quite some time. You know, it's still the same slow. Um, you know, our, our charge from the, uh, the elected board of supervisors, and I appreciate it, is that, that we're here to help people. Um, and as the community development department, we're here to help the community develop. Um, code enforcement is primarily complaint driven. It's not proactive. We don't send, um, you know, we have two code enforcement positions in our entire department out of 33 people. Um, those two positions are now sitting vacant. 
Uh, we just interviewed for one of them last week. We have a hard time keeping people in those positions. Um, people who are good at those jobs move up into other jobs, often within our department. So we have a very hard time keeping people in those positions. Uh, bottom line is um, we are not proactive. Um, we are complaint driven. Um, uh, we really take life health safety first as a priority. Uh, so if it's not a life health safety issue, um, it's in the queue. Uh, we will get to it. Uh, we do want to um, serve everyone in the community, including neighbors who don't appreciate living next to a hoarder. Uh, but um, there's only so much there's only so much the county can do and, it, and it's a very slow process. We look for voluntary compliance. Um, if people have too many junk cars in their yard, we try and they have few resources, we try to help people with resources on, on how on how they can solve their problem. We are not looking to impose fines, collect fines. It never works out ever and it's it's just not worth it. So the, the number one thing we're looking for, um, is voluntary compliance. We will work with people as long as they show forward progress on just get into conformance with the zoning ordinance and we'll see what we can do to help you. Thank you. And, and sure. you know, as realtors, that was a question because when we're trying to sell certain properties and the owners before they sold it, one of their neighbors to clean up their yard, mm -hmm. uh, what, what, you know, how long does it typically take before we can get some action if a neighbor, if a neighbor wants to complain about another neighbor? Uh, it's, it will be a um, minimum of months before there's any response um, whatsoever. We're using our building inspectors right now. If our building inspectors are out inspecting a job site in Doney Park and we have a code enforcement complaint in Doney Park and we try to get that building inspector over to confirm that the, com that the complaint is valid, that's actually a violation, and then start the informal process of uh, notify the property owner, hey, we've been informed of this violation. What, what can we do to help you get into conformance um, with the ordinance? If they won't work with us, which 99% of the time, that first contact takes care of the problem and they will start making progress, uh, typically not as quickly as the complaining neighbor would like. Um, then uh, if, if they just absolutely um, will not work with the county uh, to move towards compliance, then we can do an actual notice of violation, actually schedule uh, schedule them for a hearing with a hearing officer. Um, uh, that does not happen happen often. Um, uh, it's you know we're we we are so busy with other things we just don't have the resources to do that. So um, uh, usually we encourage people to work with their neighbors <laughs> yeah. um, on how they can how can they can improve their neighborhoods. Uh, but um, yeah, we, the last thing we want to be is the. Uh, is the tool that neighbors use when they're unhappy with each other to uh, hit each other over the head. You know, um, we don't want to be um, uh, some, you know, a um, weapon from, you know, neighbor A against neighbor B. We're just there to help. And if there is violation, we'll, we'll let them know and then we'll work with them on how can we get you into conformance. Gotcha. Thank you. That was a mm -hmm. very good description. Very good description. Uh, Mark Coletti asks, can you differentiate a tiny home versus a park model? I'm not even sure what a park model is. Good question. That is a very good question. And we actually we actually have a little matrix at the at our um, website that that lays out um, uh, a whole bunch of housing types to include park models. Mm -hmm. So park models are an interesting um, little housing unit type, I, I uh, maybe shouldn't even be calling them housing. Technically a park model is an RV, it's a recreational vehicle and it's built to the same standard. It's called the ANSI standard. And there's a, there's a plate on a, on a park model um, that looks like if you, if you saw one, anybody on this call who, who saw a park model would, would take one glance at it and say, oh, that's a tiny house. Um, but they're mass produced. Um, by several manufacturers, you know, a lot of the typical manufactured home manufacturers throughout the U.S. also make these things called park models. Um, and uh, there's a um, little development down in uh, down in Munns Park. If you're heading south on I-17, as you're going through Munns Park on the right, on the west side of the highway, you'll see a, just rows and rows of some little um, what well, looks like tiny houses, you'd look at it and say, oh, it's a tiny house village. That's a park model 
development. So those units um, are very similar to manufactured homes, uh, but they're built to a different standard than manufactured, manufactured homes. They are built to the ANSI standard, not the HUD standard. Um, however, under county code, anywhere that a manufactured home can be placed, you could place a park model. So that's some flexibility that we've um, that we've developed with uh, within the county. Um, so um, yeah, they're just a really small manufactured home uh, that 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 looks like what many people would call a tiny home. Good yeah. question. Great, thanks, Mark. And Jess, and his other question is, I think the question may be, has the GIS group caught up yet? Was that referring to, uh, Mark, you wanna unmute yourself and maybe explain that question a little better? Yeah, I was referring to Stephen's uh, question that the GIS, uh, whoever updates the information on, on the GIS website, from my knowledge and understanding, they were quite a bit behind or somebody was, that position was open of, for example, I have properties that are that are still showing old owners from four, five, six months ago. That's wow. I don't yeah. Know if that clarified, but do you know? You, maybe you can take know, it from there. Yes. I know exactly what you're asking. Yeah. So um, updates in ownership often um, actually G, uh, partial viewer uh, and partial viewer is is just the county's term for our website that's public access that I certainly encourage all of you to, to use extensively. Uh, parcel viewer is driven by a system that many people in our work know as GIS, geographic information systems, which really comes down to com computer mapping. Um, and there is staff at the county, they actually fall within the IT, information technology department, who updates um, GIS. So when there are sales, that comes from the assessor's data uh, at the county assessor's office. Um, when there's new permits, that comes from, from our systems, um, from our permitting systems. Um, if there's a change in zoning, uh, that should show up in, um, in uh, parcel viewer via the system of, of GIS. So yeah, th those systems um, uh, do try to get updated. I, I have actually noticed the exact same uh, conundrum. I've actually noticed inconsistencies with with um, one property getting updated pretty quick, and I go back and check another property somewhere else in the county, it doesn't get updated as quickly. I'm not really sure why. Um, that's certainly something I can ask um, our IT. Unfortunately, it's it's a different department; it doesn't fall under fall under our department. We we partner with them quite a bit, um, but uh, obviously we, we don't we don't share that staff. So something that they um, that they aspire to uh, to keep updated as much as possible because that's amazing transparency and information for the public. Um, however, uh, they are in the process of hiring one position that they lost or they lost an employee. Um, and, uh, and I know they, they stay backlogged. For instance, right now, um, during um, post-museum fire flooding, all the flooding that's taking place um, in county and city, particularly the east side of Flagstaff, um, GIS is constantly daily updating from information, uh, information that they get from some of the sensors um, that, uh, that were installed by the Flood Control District. I know I'm going in a really uh, deep, uh, nerdy uh, rabbit hole here, but bottom line is, is the flooding right now is keeping GIS pretty busy. So they support the GIS department um, who, uh, who supports the updates to Parcel Viewer, which is what this group would care about. Um, they are also busy creating maps to help with the flooding analyze the flooding issues um, any, and anything else that's going on in the county. When there's fires, they're typically helping map those fires as well. If there's issues at the sheriff's office, if the sheriff is having, sheriff's office is having uh, some um, law enforcement problems in certain parts of the county, GIS is helping do mapping um, analysis of maybe of where those crimes are taking place. You know, I mean, they, they help all departments across the entire county. They, they've got a big job um, and it's a really great technology. Uh, that we see being well used and, and certainly in what we do. So yeah, I'll, I will pass on the recommendation from this group that, um, hey, uh, realtors like to see the uh, parcel viewer data updated so people know what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question mark. All right. And then Jim Schweikert asked, 
though the NIMBY oppositions will inevitably occur, given that in parentheses, I believe you said your department's inclinations to approve permits are impacted by supply and demand. Is the trend significantly toward the yes, toward greater number of approvals, i.e. are you much more likely to be more flexible than usual, more open-minded, saying yes a lot more these last six months in permitting due to supply and demand, or is the opposition offsetting and holding that back just as propositionally as before? Wow, that's that's a highly intelligent question. Um, <laughs> bottom bottom line is um, uh, public opposition, uh, nimbyism only applies if it's something going to public hearing. Um, if it's something, if it's a request, uh, typically zone change, conditional use permit, or new subdivision um, or, or, or an alteration to a subdivision that requires public hearing process. If it's going for one of those things to the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Board of Supervisors, that's when public opposition matters. It's the only time public opposition matters. Um, and that's why Planning and Zoning Commission hearings and Board of Supervisor hearings are public hearings, open to the public for the public comment. So that's when the nimbyism comes out and opposition um, it's is uh, opposition is not one of the findings under the zoning ordinance to to make any of those decisions. However, um, opposition can point out those find what in those findings, such as negative impact on surrounding properties, um, negative impact on transportation facilities, you know, roads. Um, uh, when the when the public opposition brings up those issues, uh, it makes it tougher to approve those um, for those decision makers. And, and those decisions are made by those decision makers. Uh, staff helps. Um, we, we help with giving analysis, um, but those decisions are made by them, not by staff. When it comes to just any kind of permitting um, that is what we call you know, over the counter or permitted by right, if it's just a building permit, if it's things that don't require public hearing, then staff is busy. Um, I can tell you uh, the culture of our organization and, uh, and our, our vision, our mission, what we do and why we do it is to help people. Um, we try to make it, we try to make things as simple as possible. Uh, there has been some culture change in this department. Um, certainly our director, Jay Crystalman, uh, believes in helping people. We're not the department of no, we're the community development department. We're here, we're a permitting agency. We're, help, we're here to help permit. And if something doesn't meet regulations or codes, then we're here to help you get it to where it does. Um, I'd like to think that, um, that the culture of the organization has moved away from uh, what was historically known and very common in many local governments as, as being um, bureaucrats who are just looking for ways to say no instead to being people who are, who are really here to help, uh, here to accommodate. Um, I can tell you that the increased volume of, um, of permitting that we're seeing and the increased complexity of permitting that we're seeing, it is really in people's best interest if they want to get through the permitting process. Uh, instead of doing it as a DIY, um, do it yourself type project, get good professionals. Good engineers and architects understand the regulations. They know how they work. They're gonna get from point A to point B. We end up as staff having to give literally, uh, you know, educational lessons to the mom and pop who are wanting to build something themselves um, because they don't know these things. Um, you get a good licensed engineer or architect, they know their stuff. They know our codes as well, if not better than we do. Uh, and they know how and why they work. Um, and, and we can trust them. You know, if someone comes in with stamp set of drawings from an engineer or architect, um, the liability is on them. And things, things typically can go quicker uh, when, when you have good professionals involved. And I certainly experience that with, with what I work with, um, like say on big complex zone changes for big RV parks or something like that. You have a good professional on board who knows how to analyze everything. They've already done all the work and their projects, their project is gonna be a lot easier to work with. So um, I hope that answers the question. Great answer, thank sense. you. Mm -hmm. That was good, Jim. Thank yes, you. great, thank you so much. Absolutely. Great. great question. Okay, so that's all the questions that we have in the box now. So feel free to right. uh, continue uh, with your presentation. And as the uh, rest of us come up with um, some more questions, go ahead and put those in and we'll pause again when we've got a good group of questions to go with. Absolutely. So what I'm gonna do now is based on what I just showed you all on statistics on, on um, 
numbers of, of what we've been seeing over the past couple of years and increases in those, num those numbers. I'm going to run through the map and show you where a lot of that is taking place. Okay, so you get some geographic understanding of, of where of where all we're working. I hope everyone is familiar with the uh, Coconino County <laughs> map geography. I realize, I mean, I, uh, planners tend to be map people, um, but uh, I'll, I'll try to explain anything um, that anybody doesn't understand. So I'm, I'm going to go from north to south because that's the easiest way to look at the map and talk about it. Um, right up here, um, uh, let's see, Greenhaven is, is where we'll start. Greenhaven is an unincorporated county uh, community, uh, much like, say, Kachina Village um, or Munns Park, uh, that has a community water and wastewater system, and it practically functions as a suburb of Page, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's been up there a long time. There's a bunch of platted lots up there. There's some, there's some vacant commercial land up there. Um, it's, it's been up there. I, I'd have to look back and see historically when Green, Green Haven was originally zoned and platted. Uh, amazing, beautiful location looks, looks out over Lake Powell. Mm -hmm. Um, but we are seeing increased development there. So where we have, we've had vacant residential lots for years, people are building on those lots. Um, there is some multifamily zoning up there. People are doing a townhouse development. Um, there's some, uh, commercial zoning up there. There was an old uh, gas station um, right off the highway there uh, that heads into Utah, and it got bought up and completely redeveloped as a new pilot, um, so everything new there. Um, the RV and boat storage uh, is, um, is expanding and includes some mini storage, and some of those property owners are figuring out how to do a mixed-use development. They're throwing some of those park models that Mark asked about um, look like tiny homes onto their property and just renting them out by the night. Uh, and there, you know, there's a way to do that through the permitting process. So seeing a lot of activity up in Greenhaven, and we anticipate that we'll continue to see activity in Greenhaven. That's a good place to develop because there's the community water and wastewater system. Zoning's in place, um, lots are in place. Um, if you, uh, uh, and of course, Page as a city is certainly seeing its own share of development. And like all places, um, uh, much of the city of Page was eaten up with vacation rentals, homes being converted to vacation rentals or just being used as vacation rentals. And it's really driving a workforce housing issue. You know, where, where are the people who work at the services in the community, where, where are they going to live? And some of that uh, we think is going to Greenhaven. Um, so we'll continue to, continue to see that development. Um, Marble Canyon, incredibly interesting little spot right here. If you know where it is, um, uh, right on the west side of the Colorado River, when you cross over the Navajo um, uh, Navajo Bridge, um, uh, Marble Canyon um, has a spot that um, little uh, um, historic lodge. The Marble Canyon Lodge um, was purchased by a hotel company and is being redeveloped. They went through a rezoning process to expand their zoning and kind of change up their entitlements, what they can do. And there's a big project going at Marble Canyon. So where the, the entire Vermilion Cliffs uh, Marble Canyon area, if you were driving to the north rim of the Grand Canyon, for anybody who knows that area, um, you'd go past several little commercial spots that just kind of stayed status quo for decades. Very hard to develop up there, hard to get equipment up there, hard to get people up there, um, lack of water. Uh, but the Marble Canyon spot, um, uh, looked attractive to a developer, and they are putting a lot of money into redeveloping the historic Marble Canyon and expanding it. Um, so it'll be lodging. They're adding lodging units. Um, they're improving the quality of it, um, and they're adding some other amenities. Uh, they anticipate holding um, people renting it out for conferences. Um, very remote area. Uh, Page is the closest area. Page will have to provide uh, fire and emergency services. Um, but uh, we we see it as interesting that if that commercial development um, makes a big investment in that area, this very rural, um, very remote part of the county could potentially be seeing some other similar development. Um, as we head south, nothing really much to speak of uh, through Tuba City. Tuba City has a county island in it that has always continued to have a little bit of commercial development. Um, but not seeing any, any changes there, haven't seen anything there in a couple of years. 
Um, if we jump over across the uh, Grand Canyon National Park, um, Tucson is its own incorporated community. Um, so we don't really pay attention to much of what takes place inside of Tucson. Uh, my observation, it's staying status quo. But you get down here to the valley area, and here's where we're seeing a lot of activity. This is where all your commercial campground glamping operations are going. There's a bunch of platted land in here uh, that was platted in the 60s, 70s, um, that has no utilities to it, uh, has very poor dirt roads throughout this network, but there's platted lots, one acre lots, and we're seeing more and more people buy them, um, often putting things on those properties with no permits. Um, you see some very interesting things in this area, uh, but certainly seeing this is the hub of our glamping developments. And it makes sense because it's right at the confluence of 64 heading south to Williams and 180 heading uh, southeast to Flagstaff, where all your tourists heading to south of the Grand Canyon, generally 6 million plus a year are going right through here. If you could put up a glamping operation in Valley, you will get clients. Um, Red Lake, just south, uh, also a unincorporated county area, much like Valley. Um, Red Lake is seeing some of the same, some of the same development, uh, some of the glamping operations, um, and just some continued residential development. Howard Mesa Ranches is in the Red Lake area. Um, uh, south Rim Ranches is in the Valley area. Both of those are 36 acre plus lot size developments and we continue to see development in, in those. Those are very hard places to develop, um, 36 acres or larger. Um, people, are, people are figuring out how to develop with um, on-site solar systems, backup generator, uh, maybe some rainwater collection or just haul water. Um, pretty remote, but, but people are doing it and people are continuing to do it. Um, maybe we'll just head down here to Williams. We do see right outside the city limits of Williams, um, you all probably saw in the news um, a um, mixed-use amusement park um, uh, along with lodging and residential development was being discussed um, in conjunction with the city of Williams. Um, if that happens, that will all be in the city limits of Williams. Uh, but because of the interest in that um, uh, commercial kind of almost amusement park based development. Some of the surrounding land in the county is now looking at um, RV parks, glamping, um, lodging operations in the county. Um, in the parks area right here, um, continued, uh, continued status quo. As a matter of fact, we have um, reestablishment of an old RV park in parks uh, on the Planning and Zoning Commission agenda next week. Um, and there's still some lots and land available um, in parks. If you head south of I-40, south of parks, we do have a couple of camping operations, uh, glamping operations that are, have already been approved that are getting built south of, uh, south of I-40 off um, Garland Prairie Road in the, in the parks area. As you head um, further east in towards, in towards Flagstaff, you get into Belmont. Belmont is a real hotbed of activity for us. Um, those of you who, are, who um, have worked in the Flagstaff Meadows, what we typically call the Flag Meadows subdivision, know that that subdivision continues to build out. It includes now a new uh, townhome community um, in Belmont. Um, we updated the Belmont area plan a couple of years ago. That area plan process helped um, provide some land use policy guidance uh, that has really helped that area. Um, so residential development in Belmont, um, all of it north of the I-40. At the exit there, right next to the pilot, um, the county is partnering with ADOT on some uh, road improvements to solve some of the traffic problems with um, semi-trucks going in and out of the pilot at Belmont with the residential neighbors there in the Flagstaff Meadows subdivision. Um, on the Planning and Zoning Commission agenda next week, we have a new duplex subdivision um, going immediately west of the pilot. So kind of a new expansion location, um, a little bit removed from where all the Flagstaff Meadows subdivision has been, um, just west of the, uh, of the pilot. So continuing to see expansion there. South of I-40 in Belmont is where you see lots of 
uh, heavy commercial and industrial development. Um, so there's been some um, um, some sales of property. The old uh, SCA tissue plant has gone to a company that is um, intending to do what we commonly refer to as forest product processing. I believe they'll be doing something with with um, some of the low value um, wood that comes out of forest thinning projects. Um, not even sure what what that will be necessarily. Um, but uh, just continued expansion, truck companies, crane companies, people who need industrial zoning and large lots are going into south of Belmont. Of course, um, south of Belmont, uh, south side of I-40 is also where Camp Navajo, the uh, Army National Guard base is, and Camp Navajo continues to have a program where they are um, uh, open for leasing land on their property for different types of warehousing, commercial, industrial development. Um, none of that has really taken off yet, uh, but we continue to see the interest. Um, a lot of that results in traffic conflicts um, at that one interchange. So um, we, can, we can foresee that um, uh, there will just continue to be, be growth in, uh, in Belmont. It's a great location just west of Flagstaff and with such high demand in Flagstaff. It's a little bit more affordable housing often, um, and it's available commercial and industrial land all there at that one interchange. So hence a lot of traffic at that interchange. Um, of course, then you get into Flagstaff. You all know what, what's taking place in the, uh, in the city of Flagstaff. If we go north, northwest, outside of Flagstaff to what's labeled here as the Fort Valley area, Fort Valley, Baderville, Anybody who's driven out that direction continues to see that um, there's several subdivisions in that area that, um, that continue to sell lots, and we can continue to see rooftops going up in the uh, in the Fort Valley area. Um, if we uh, jump across Flagstaff to the east, get out to Doney Park. Again, Doney Park continues to grow. Our staff is currently working with a committee out in Doney Park to do an update to the Doney Park area plan. Uh, so that's just a land use policy document on what they wanna see in the future for their neighborhood. Um, very much the consensus of the community and certainly the people on our committee is they want it to see, they want to see it stay rural. Uh, they do not wanna see subdivisions with smaller lots. Uh, they don't even like seeing one acre lots. They prefer to see two and a half acre or larger lots. So just uh, so back to some of that nimbyism, um, and generally in the Doney Park area, um, there are some platted subdivisions. I believe the most recent one was Johnson Ranch. Uh, they go down to about one acre. Um, if there are any future subdivisions, uh, the neighborhood will most likely come out being opposed to anything that's smaller than two, two and a half acre lots. They're trying to keep a rural environment in that place. Um, we do have some commercial pressures along 89 where it runs through Doney Park, um, where, where people are wanting to do commercial development. There's some commercial, there's some vacant commercial land there. And uh, so we continue to see some development on that vacant commercial land. Every time we see um, a zone change request um, from residential to commercial, right fronting on Highway 89, um, it's a tough sell and usually gets denied. Um, because uh, the neighbors, the, the people in Doney Park do not want to see commercial expansion. They don't want to see more commercial. Um, so that's generally what we see in Doney Park. Um, if you go down uh, the 89 towards Sedona through Oak Creek Canyon, again, there's only so much land available in Oak Creek Canyon. Um, it's very sought after. And uh, so most of that is built out and we just see redevelopment, you know, people um, improving or redeveloping properties. Slowly, you see some of the old 1950s, 60s manufactured homes that are in there getting taken out of spots and sometimes, uh, you know, million dollar houses going in their place. Um, so that, that just happens over time. That is where we saw one of our little uh, tiny, first tiny home, what people would call a tiny home community but was really just two lots with a total of four tiny homes between two lots. Um, if we look further south, maybe go down uh, Lake Mary Road, uh, Mormon Lake continues to see a little bit of development where there are available lots. There's only so many left in the Mormon Lake area as well. 
Um, but if you get down to what's commonly referred to as Happy Jack, Blue Ridge, Forest Lakes, this farthest south region right here, there are many platted lots in some subdivisions down there. Clear Creek Pines is one that comes to mind. Um, they have just sat vacant for decades. As a matter of fact, people would buy those lots, people who lived in, in somewhere in the valley in the greater Phoenix area, and they would drive their RV up onto those lots in the summertime, and they do a temporary use permit through our department to park and camp in their RV on their one acre lot uh, somewhere in this area for the summer. Well, um, with low interest rates and COVID, many of those people are now building. So our building inspectors are busy down in this area. Um, that's, uh, it's a long drive for our staff to get down there, um, but we are definitely seeing some increased activity um, in the furthest south area. That pretty much covers it geographically um, on what we're seeing where. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions based on, based on the map and what's taking place where. And, and then, um, Melinda, we can jump to your list of topics and see, uh, see if we've covered them. Okay, sounds, sounds pretty good so far. Uh, Chad Dragos asked, and this is a good question, I was gonna ask this as well. In Doney Park, did the tribe submit plans for the old horsemen? What, what's oh, going on over there? Good question, that's a hot one. Man, somebody, somebody your, your folks here know exactly what's going on, what all of our favorite issues are. That's so, some great professionals, that's for sure. Uh, horsemen's Lodge. Uh, iconic place in Doney Park. By the way, their sign is grandfathered. It's way too big and the lights are way too bright. That would never be permitted today. Um, but um, Horseman's Lodge is zoned residential. It is a legal non-conforming, more commonly called grandfathered uh, commercial use for a restaurant. Uh, uh, Navajo Nation Gaming bought it um so which really scared the heck out of a lot of the neighbors um but uh navajo nation um uh has continued they they want to use it as a hospitality um use they have kept the legal non-conforming status in place by opening it up occasionally or parking a food truck on the property to make sure they don't lose their legal non-conforming status they can't go longer than 180 days six months without operating so their intent with us, or what they've stated, is that they intend to keep it as a restaurant, status quo as a restaurant. So they have not submitted any plans. They are just working um, to retain the legal nonconforming or grandfathered rights. Um, many of you know that as private land, it falls under county zoning ordinance um, and, um, and permitting. Uh, and that is what the tribe is doing as of now. Um, if it became trust land, if they converted the land to trust land, then they can do, uh, they can do whatever they wanted. Um, and that's certainly some of the concern. Uh, but the county has no, we have no uh, say in that. If they choose to pursue becoming trust land, uh, we hope they would engage the county. We hope they would look to the Doney Park Timberline Fernwood area plan for, to, to indicate what the, what the community would like to see in their neighborhood. Um, but uh, if it becomes trust land, that's that's their choice and they could do whatever they want with it but certainly the indications to us uh what's been communicated from navajo nation is that they want to retain it as a restaurant as of now that's all we know okay great thank you for that update mm -hmm. um okay so that was the only, only other questions that were there uh thank you for that and we'll let you go ahead and proceed all right let's see where were we okay I'm just going to jump back to your list of topics here, Melinda, and I see, wow, we, um, we have used more time uh, than I thought we would. So we can run through these topics, and I'll, and I'll kind of just um, respond to them. Um, and I think, I think many of these we've already, um, we've already responded to. Um, and after we run through these, or as we run through them, if, if questions come up, feel free to interrupt and we'll try to address the questions and then we can do a uh, wrap up questions following that. Okay, first one, what development projects are currently in place but not completed? Um, those coming, those in a review and or projected to affect Flagstaff. So um, probably the, uh, I think when we went through the map, I addressed a lot of them. Um, there's a lot of Greenhaven up at the Utah border near Page. A lot of commercial development, 
um, that is still in process. You're not seeing it yet. Um, there's proposed restaurant, hotel up there. You're not yet seeing, uh, but certainly they have um, they've pursued their process with us. Um, Marble Canyon, I told you about, um, that was approved for a zone change. Um, you're not gonna, if you drive past there, through past the old Marble Canyon Lodge, it'll, it looks just like uh, what you've seen for decades. Um, but that has been approved and we do anticipate, we've been in contact with that developer. We do anticipate some big changes there soon. Um, and it's a really pretty design also, I, I would note that. Um, uh, the um, 64180 campgrounds, we talked about those. Um, you're already seeing several of them. Um, the most notable ones, the ones that pop out uh, that you see when you drive by are under canvas and um, uh, gosh, clear sky. Um, those are the ones that jump out, but there's certainly several other smaller ones uh, that have gotten approval over the past few months. And we anticipate that you'll start seeing more of that. Um, in Belmont, we talked about several things in Belmont. Um, what I neglected to tell you about was there is a new um, RV park uh, mixed use development that has been approved at Belmont um, way west of the interchange on the north side of I-40. So west of the pilot, west of Flagstaff Meadows subdivision. Uh, it's called Village Camp, uh, Village Camp Flagstaff. It will be a mixed use um, RV park. Uh, it will include people who stay like for the whole summer. It will include those park models that we were talking about earlier, that people could own their park model and just leave it there year round. Um, and it will include tent camping. So there's, there's certainly one big um, uh, mixed use uh, glamping RV park development that you will, that you will certainly see from the highway. Uh, they're moving dirt right now, um, but we anticipate that certainly by next year, you'll be seeing something taking, taking place there. Um, the one other development uh, that you probably heard about in the news uh, that you will now start seeing some movement on is uh, what we re now refer to as Kachina Highlands. Um, it was referred to as Kachina North for some time. So that's a piece of, largest piece of vacant property left in Kachina Village. Uh, it's up to the Kachina Village uh, water and community water and wastewater system. Um, the developers who owned the Kachina Highlands land, uh, right off, you'll be able to see it from I-17, um, uh, sought a increase in zoning over this past year. It was not approved. Uh, the Kachina Highlands development has been approved for a hundred and um, I think it was either 130 or 140 lots for several years. Uh, they tried to increase that to include duplexes and jump up to 172 lots. Um, that attempt uh, was denied at the Board of Supervisors. Uh, so they are gonna move forward with either their 130 or 140 lots. Uh, it will be an all detached single family residential development, no duplexes uh, as was requested. And um, that final plat has now been approved. So you can anticipate seeing some, some dirt turning at some point here in the near future in uh, the north side of Kachina Village. So that would really cover everything um, that, uh, um, that has gone through an approval process, but you're, you're not yet seeing anything on the ground. All right, um, next item, please include residential, commercial, multifamily, et cetera. Um, I think we've done that. Uh, there's a little bit of vacant multifamily in Kachina Village. Uh, immediately south of the pick and run store. Um, and the multifamily zoning has been in place for years. Um, you'll see a row of duplexes there uh, on the south side of, uh, of the pick and run at Kachina Village. And some of that vacant land in there is gonna get filled in with some more, some more multifamily here in the near, near future. Um, probably duplexes, maybe triplexes, but duplexes tends to be a preferred option for several reasons. Um, any projected or submitted projects that are of concern? Um, not really. I, I can tell you, um, continued push for RV parks um, at certain locations often met with um, neighborhood opposition. 
there's some interest in, in another RV park in Munns Park. There's so much neighborhood opposition, we still haven't received the application. So probably the multifamily or just higher density residential uh, manufactured home parks, um, and then actual commercial RV parks um, always generate some neighborhood concern. So we can pretty much count on any of those that get submitted. If they have to go through a public hearing process, um, they're gonna have a lot of neighborhood opposition. Uh, will homeowners face issues with developments? Well, I guess that depends on the perspective. Yeah, existing homeowners uh, typically do not wanna see changes. Nobody likes to see change. Uh, those of you who are realtors realize that land has to get developed. People need homes and I'm sure you all wanna sell those homes. Um, so um, uh, yeah, uh, um, lack of transportation infrastructure, roads, um, often are being pushed to their capacity limits, lack of water in areas in the county that do not already have sustainable water systems, that's going to be what constrains development and anything that requires a zone change through a public hearing process uh, for any kind of increase, certainly any increased density, increased numbers of units um, is certainly going to face opposition. Is the county planning on making any changes to the requirements to build develop? Uh, short answer is no. Um, we went through a big uh, update to our zoning ordinance in 2019. Um, following that, uh, we very quickly got our building codes updated to the 2018 uh, IBC. So um, following that, we do not anticipate any changes in requirements to build or develop. Any, environment, any environmental concerns or changes to take into account for future planning and development? Um, lack of water and um, uh, uh, continued what we have seen for many years is what we call wildland urban interface with um, forest fire risk. So that's always a concern with new development is, um, is the site forested has it been thinned properly to reduce the risk on that site? Um, uh, often the best sites abut national forest. Everybody wants national forest in their backyard, um, but it has the, is the national forest, uh, is that area thinned? Is there a risk? Um, so that's, that's one of the biggest environmental concerns and obviously not going away. Um, what are the biggest hurdles for developing? Um, gosh, uh, biggest hurdles, um, lack of water and uh, public opposition. Uh, how can we as realtors help educate our homeowners and communities to help or best prepare them from the building process requirements and future changes to Flagstaff developments? Gosh, um, that's, that's a good question. Um, really, uh, to me, the, the best answer is, is some self-education and then relying on professionals. Um, so good licensed contractors, um, good licensed uh, design professionals, architects and engineers. And the last one, how can we help the county as realtors? I'll, I'll tell you how you can help the county. <laughs> is, um, um, is use our resources. Use Parcel Viewer, familiarize yourself with it, um, get better at using it, and, uh, and familiarize yourself with the zoning ordinance. That will help you quite a bit. Um, people are often wanting to buy land in the unincorporated county because they want to run some kind of business from it. Um, we can certainly help with that, but the better you understand the zoning ordinance, the, the better you'll understand what's possible um, to go into residentially zoned property. The better you understand where those pockets of commercial land are, uh, and some of it is vacant, the more you can steer people who are wanting to do commercial development towards that commercial land. That will be much easier for them than trying to rezone land that is zoned residential to commercial. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for those great answers. Yeah. Uh, Nadia, Nadia has another question here. Uh, flood areas. I came across recently three to four properties with foundation issues, more or less serious foundation damages. Um, and then just, I follow up, are there any areas with, um, I'm not sure what that word is, Nadia. Flood issues. Have your flood issues? 
with areas with having flood issues, maybe. Um, yeah. You know, we're going to see more of that now because of the museum fire. So, um, yes, just heavy flood issues, just uh, foundations damaged by flood, or let's say somehow my clients were asking, what's the reason seeing two or three properties with foundation issues built mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s, early 70s? Where mm -hmm. were they, Nadia? Um, 8601, 8605. Okay, but in a particular neighborhood? I know that uh, I tend to I see a lot of sunny side, for instance, with foundation not, issues. Not off the top of my head. Okay. Um, to double check again. That, that's okay. Okay. So flood issues. What 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 do we know about that and how that's going to change and affect us? Well, in the city, that's that's a whole nother that's a whole nother thing. Um, and I would encourage you to, to have the same conversation with with the city on um, on how you would work with flooding and foundation issues in the city. Um, in the county, uh, in the unincorporated county, parcel viewer has a link. Um, when you scroll down the dialogue box, once you click on any property. You'll sc scroll down the dialogue block box, and um, there's a floodplain uh, list right there. It's either in floodplain or not in floodplain. What the classification of that floodplain is, you can click on. You can click on a hyperlink there, and you open another window of Parcel Viewer that is just the floodplain map, and it'll show where floodplains are. Typically, people know if they're in floodplain or not, um, because if you are in floodplain and you're trying to build in floodplain. Then you're required. You are required to have flood insurance. That typically does dissuade people from building in an actual mapped floodplain. Um, probably the area in the unincorporated county that we see having the biggest drainage issues that is not technically a floodplain but has water flow issues would be the Fort Valley Baderville area, because there's high groundwater there. Because they get a lot of sheet flow um uh runoff from snow melt and just any precipitation um all of the properties in that area have to be built with elevated um, on-site wastewater systems often called a wisconsin mound um, makes it more expensive makes it more difficult and there's no doubt that um that people experience ponding water on their property uh which is, which is a concern still a popular area because the views of the peaks from there are amazing. Um, good access to Snowbowl, uh, if you wanna ski, good access to the 180, um, so quick access into town. Um, so always popular, people like being out there, um, but uh, well-documented information on um, drainage issues. Uh, our department has, a, um, has engineering staff that I told you about. When you get grading permits, that's analyzed for drainage. Um, we can help some. Again, uh, hiring a good engineer if you're concerned with developing a property with drainage issues. Um, a good civil engineer is going to be able to help you navigate those. Right. And, and just in case y'all don't know, I'll just put a plug out there that uh, a few years ago when we created the map overlay functions in our MLS, you click on the overlays on the inset of the map and scroll down. Not only will you find neighborhoods, but you'll also find the FEMA flood zone map that comes directly from FEMA. So Good. we've tried to help educate our, um, our realtors as well so they have that, that information. Um, so just to make a note of that, if you're not familiar with that, you can find neighborhood schools, um, FEMA flood zones, uh, different zip codes, all, the, all those things are there for you that comes directly from that. But I, I use the County Parcel Viewer, this is no joke, probably every other day on a regular basis because it's got such a great wealth of information. Uh, one of the questions I have is, you used to be able to click at the bottom, if you click on the parcel viewer and, and click on that parcel, it'll take you and open up to the page with the property owner's information um, and other details. There used to be at the very bottom where you could access permits, and now that does not seem to be available. I mean, is there another hmm. place to be able to find that? That Thank you for letting me know that. I think I've heard that um, from other places as well. No, that, that is still supposed to be the link. I think we're just having some glitches with our system. Um, to update. So I can certainly, uh, in addition to just general updates to Parcel Viewer, I can ask our GIS department um, uh, why why people are having a hard time accessing permits. Yeah, I know with appraisers too, just trying to find on um, add-ons and those types of things. And as we try to do that preliminary information before we list a property, it's pretty helpful. So yeah. Uh, other than that, I find it extremely useful. I play with it all the time. I love it. I can print from it. So if you're not aware, you can create images from it. 
uh, it's a great tool. So I'm, we're grateful that you guys have what you have up there. And I, it sounds like you're a little bit short staffed and, and taking on a lot of challenges right now. With I was also earlier this year, uh, it, and tell me if you may know this or if I'm incorrect or not, but um, there were, uh, Coconino County was in the top 10 of places that people moved to during COVID. In fact, I believe the numbers put us at number six in the nation for where people were actually wow. moving to. Uh, does that sound about on par with what you're seeing as far as growth? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and we all know it from, from housing prices mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the region. Right, right, okay. Well, I don't see any other questions here. Uh, did anybody else have anything that you wanna put? We've got three minutes. Uh, of just this time left for us today and we'll let you guys get on with the rest of your day. Uh, feel free if you want to go ahead and take off your mic or you can put it in the chat box and we can wrap wrap up today. It was very, very informative, informative Jess. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really insightful. Absolutely. Well, I um, appreciate it. This is part of what we do. Um, and um, I appreciate learning from you guys and I appreciate the opportunity uh, to help, you know, just help the community. Absolutely. That's what we do as realtors, very community based. And so any information that we can obtain and share to our clients, uh, the rest of our community as well, too, and make a difference in the decisions that they make, um, hopefully continue to work together uh, with you all. Uh, Chad Drago says, thanks, Jess and NAR staff. You're very welcome, Chad, on behalf of NAR. And, uh, and Nadia also says, thanks. So, thank you so much for the great info. So some Round of applauses there for you, Jess. All right. Great, okay. Well, I think that's just about it. So again, thank you so much. Uh, don't forget to join us just about every Tuesday. We have your lunch and learn. You can go to our nazrealtor.com website, scroll down to events and education, click on that. A nice little calendar will pop up for you and you can register for any classes that we have, whether it's lunch and learn, we've got GRI, risk management, all kinds of fun stuff uh, coming at you as we head all the way into August. If you can believe we're already talking about the eighth month of 2021. Uh, so check it out next <laughs> and next week, uh, as I mispronounced earlier, we actually have the uh, planning and development from the Flagstaff, the city. So now we've got a great um, broad view within the county of uh, Coconino. And so we'll kind of narrow it in on the city of Flagstaff. So more great information to come. Thank you there. Ben Teresa is showing you how you can actually uh, connect to it right there and register. Love to see all your wonderful selves there. So please join us. And if there's any information that you'd like us to bring, it's my job as your professional development chair to make sure that uh, whatever you guys feel like you need to be educated, uh, stay abreast with that we're able to bring that to you. So if you have any ideas, feel free to reach me or reach out to NAR and we'll make sure that we can get some things scheduled for you. That's about it. That's all we have. Uh, Jess, anything else you'd like to leave us with? No, I just appreciate you guys having me. We are very grateful to have you. So thank you very much. And uh, hopefully see you all next week. Jess, have a wonderful rest of the day, a wonderful week. And thanks for all that you do for Flagstaff. Well. Thanks. Have a great Bye -bye. day. Bye-bye.